Well, welcome back for our second week of Luke 15. 20, no. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do that to anybody yet. Lucky for you, this might be a shorter message. But that's only because there's three verses compared to next week when there's a whole lot more. So, you get a little off this week and you get it added on next week. And of course, this week's been hectic. Hasn't it been for you? So much so. And Judy will like this one. Because I was so busy yesterday and all this week with training and stuff. And I knew I'd be up late working on a message. I had four bottles of Mountain Dew, starting after I got off work. This morning, I'm a little, a little jiffy. So what may be a longer message than what I thought might be a whole lot shorter, so we'll have to see how that goes. And luckily, so far, I haven't heard any grumbling about a series in Luke, so you might just have to listen to me, you know, next week and be done. But... I do hold the right that if I hear grumbling that I extend it a week. So, and of course, you know, the whole thing that started Jesus giving these three parables was because the tax collectors and the sinners were coming to listen to Jesus. And the scribes and Pharisees were sitting there complaining and grumbling about it. Kind of how when you're 22 weeks into Ecclesiastes. Now, who remembers the classification that the Pharisees gave to these people that didn't keep the law as they wrote it? Am I going to have to give that message again? Mm. The people of the land. Remember those people from last week? The Pharisees would not be caught with them for any reason whatsoever. Not even to do business unless there was absolutely no choice. And with Jesus being a teacher and hanging around and teaching those type of people, you know, like us, it was just unheard of and a very terrible thing. And so they were grumbling and they were complaining. And so... To keep on with our recap, last week we looked at the shepherd's compassion. First was for the lost sheep. We learned the word lost used here is the same as in John 3.16, meaning perish. So this lost sheep, or us in this parable, we're going to die if the shepherd did not find it. Two, his compassion was for a loved sheep. The lost sheep may have wandered away from the shepherd, but it was still precious to him. God loved us so much, the great shepherd Jesus came to gather up the lost sheep. And third, the shepherd's compassion was for a lone sheep. Another shepherd may have counted the personal cost and decided to let that one sheep go and be lost forever. But the great shepherd counts even one sheep as precious and worth going for. And then we looked at the shepherd's commitment, the sacrificial commitment. For the shepherd, the search was dangerous, and death was always a possibility. And as we discussed, for Jesus, death was an absolute certainty. Jesus said in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And the second commitment was a successful commitment. The shepherd was committed to finding that sheep until it was found. And then we looked at the shepherd's conquest. First, it involves the rescue. The sheep had been found and brought out of danger, just as Jesus has delivered us from the penalty of our sins. The second conquest involves rest. After the sheep is saved, it finds itself resting upon the strong shoulders of the shepherd. 
Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me, all who labor are in heavy laden, I will give you rest. What better feeling than resting upon his shoulders? And the third conquest is that it involves rejoicing. Many of the flocks were owned by the villages. So when a lost sheep was found, the entire village celebrated. Much like God and all those in heaven celebrate when one of God's lost are found and brought home. For this morning, we're going to look at the next parable that Jesus was giving, Luke 15, 8 through 10. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds that coin? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is a joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So the first thing this morning is we're going to talk about that coin. The missing coin. Now the coin in question in this parable was probably a silver drachma. And it would not be difficult to lose a coin in a Palestinian peasant's house. And it might take a long search to find it. The houses were very dark, for they were lit by only one little circular window, not much more than about 18 inches across, and that's if you're lucky, because most of the homes had no window. The floor was beaten earth, covered with dry reeds and rushes, and to look for a coin on a floor like that was very much like looking for a needle in a haystack. In our assumption, from reading those verses might be that the woman is poor and as why even a single coin is so important. We can imagine that she carefully tends to her little hoard of coins, counting them off and to double check that they are still there where she left them, keeping them safe in a bag or other container in a safe place in her home. Her home is simple and with baked brick walls and dirt floors. The woman who has had a successful search stands at the balcony of her home. And in her hand, she holds the long-sought coin, sharing her joy with friends and neighbors. We can imagine that what happens next is the woman takes the coin back inside her house, carefully places it back in its container with the other nine coins tucked safely away. But what if the coins aren't kept tucked away? What if the coins are on display almost every day of this woman's life? From my studies, I found it is a Jewish custom for women, or for a woman to possess 10 silver or gold coins, which will be presented by their bridegroom on the day of their engagement. Those coins may contain the groom's family name or some other symbol related to their family. And from that day till the day of marriage, she has to take those coins and keep wiping them, shining them, which means that she is thinking of the groom. And so on the day of marriage, those coins are displayed on their ornaments, either on their head or as a chain. When she had the headdress with the ten coins, it was so inalienable, inalienable there, here that it, would, it could not even be taken from her for debt. Imagine that. Your family owes so much in debt, but they can't touch that because of the symbol of it. It may well be that it was one of these coins that the woman had lost. And so she searched for it as any woman would search if she lost her marriage ring. Mary Grahams of Alberta, Canada, lost her engagement ring while working in her garden back in 2004. We looked high and low on our hands and knees, said the 83-year-old Grahams. We couldn't find it. I thought for sure either they rototilled it or something happened to it. And after she speedily bought a replacement, she never told her husband. I thought for sure he'd give me heck or something. 
Recently, however, the ring turned up on a carrot Graham's daughter-in-law had pulled out of the ground. I asked my husband if he recognized the ring, her daughter-in-law said, and he said, yeah. His mother had lost her engagement ring years ago in a garden and never found it again. And it turned up on this carrot. A very odd-looking carrot at that. If you look at it, it grew perfectly around the ring. It was pretty weird looking. Never seen a one-carat ring before. I did. Either way we look at it, either because they may need the coin to live off of, or if it was an important symbol of her marriage, the lost coin was very valuable to this woman. So what'd she do? Our second point this morning is she lit the lamp and swept the floor. So after the woman noticed her coin missing, she lit the lamp. And as I mentioned earlier, the houses typically had one window, if any, for those that were not wealthy. Most of the time, the only light they had was that lamp or light coming through the door. And how could she look for that silver coin with such little light? Some of you might have heard about the man looking for some lost money under the street lamp at night. A policeman started helping him look. After a few moments, the policeman asked the man, exactly where did you lose the money? The man replied, oh, I lost it halfway down the block. The policeman replied, then why are you searching here? The man said, because the light is so much better. It does help to have light when you're looking for something, doesn't it? Before Jesus finds us, we are lost in the darkness of sin. Jesus came into this world to provide the light of truth. John 8, 12 says, Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And of course, the next thing the woman did was she started to sweep the house. With the floor being dirt, possibly covered with dried reeds and such, she would sweep the floor hoping that she might see a shiny glint from the coin or hear the little tink as it was moved on the floor. I'm not sure how well you can hear a tink on dirt. Number three, she was searching for it diligently. Imagine a woman frantically sweeping the floor looking for that missing coin. She was going to seek diligently until she found that coin. Albert Einstein the great physicist was once traveling from Princeton on a train when a conductor came down the aisle, punching the tickets of every passenger. When he came to the famous professor, Einstein reached into his vest pocket. He couldn't find his ticket. So he reached into his trouser pockets. It wasn't there. So he reached, or he looked into his briefcase, but he still couldn't find it. Then he looked in the seat beside him. He still could not find that ticket. The conductor said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded appreciatively. The conductor continued down the aisle punching tickets. As he was ready to move to the next car, he turned around and saw the great physicist down on his hands and knees looking under his seat for that ticket. The conductor rushed back and said, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. I know who you are. No problem, you don't need a ticket, I'm sure you bought one. Einstein looked at him and said, young man, I too know who I am. What I don't know is where I'm going. <laughs> don't worry, I'm here next week too. <laughs> Just as a woman was diligently searching for that coin, we should also be searching for the lost. Just like when we were found with all that dirt and filth, the blood of Jesus purified and cleansed us. 1 John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. 
The light of Jesus can show us that little glint of the lost. Don't we owe it to Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins, to be on the lookout for others that Jesus died for as well? The only difference between us is that they have not yet been found. And number four, when she found a coin, she rejoiced. Last week I mentioned that when a shepherd could return to town after finding that lost sheep, they would all celebrate that lost, that lost sheep had been found. But in the second parable, it is no different. The woman was so excited that she found the missing coin that she calls her friends and neighbors, and together they rejoice. And at the heart of the city in London is Charing Cross. All distances across the city are measured from its central point. Locals refer it simply as the cross. And one day a child became lost in the bustling metropolis. A city police officer, or a bobby as they are referred to in London, came to the child's aid to try and help him return to his family. The bobby asked the child a variety of questions in an attempt to discover where the boy lived, but to no avail. Finally, with tears streaming down the boy's face, he said, if you will take me to the cross, I think I can find my way from there. And what an apt description of the Christian life, isn't it? The cross is both the starting place of our new life in Christ, but also the place we must return to time and time again to keep our bearings in life. Just like the lost sheep from last week and the lost coin from this week, imagine the celebration that took place when this boy returned home. Just like in verse 7, Jesus tied up his parable very neatly. Luke 15, 10. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. One commentator wrote, In either case, it is easy to think of the joy of the woman when at last she saw the glint of the elusive coin and when she held it in her hand again. God said, Jesus is like that. The joy of God and of all the angels when one sinner comes home. And that is like the joy of a home when a coin which has stood between them and starvation has been found. It is like the joy of a woman who loses her most precious possession with a value far beyond money and then finds it again. Another commentator wrote, there is perhaps something Jewish about verse 10's reference to the angels. Rather than use the name of God and risk taking it in vain, faithful Jewish persons would often use the throne of God or the angels as a reference to God himself and all those that are in his presence. Angels reflect the heart of God himself. When an individual repents, God takes time to celebrate and he invites all heaven to celebrate with him. And this speaks volumes about the value of every individual in God's sight. The jubilant shepherds called his friends and they rejoiced over the little lamb that was lost and is now found. The woman was so overjoyed when she recovered her lost coin, she plans a party to celebrate it. Even so, Jesus said there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. In his book, Just Like Jesus, Max Lucado wrote, Let one child consent to be dressed in righteousness and begin the journey home and heaven pours the punch, strings the streamers, and throws the confetti. When a soul is saved, the heart of Jesus becomes the night sky on the 4th of July, radiant with explosions of cheer. William Barclay wrote, No Pharisee has ever dreamed of a God like that. A great Jewish scholar has admitted that this is the one absolutely new thing which Jesus taught about God that he actually searched for us. A Jew might have agreed that those who came crawling home to God in self-abasement and prayed for pity might find it, but he would never have conceived of a God who went out to search for the sinners. 
We believe in the seeking love of God because we see that love incarnate in Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came to seek and to save that which was lost. R.C. Sproul wrote, This story is not about silver coins. However, it is about people. How far do we have to look in order to find people who are lost? They are all around us. There are millions of people in this world who know nothing of Jesus Christ. And yet the Lord of the church has commanded us to go into all of the world. Some have yet to go into all of their communities because they have fallen for the lie that evangelism is no longer necessary. In fact, not only is it not necessary, it is a negative social activity. Some adopt the viewpoint that no one has the right to seek to proselytize other people to the religious viewpoint. If that is true, then Jesus Christ was the chief violator of human rights because he made that kind of activity the central business of his life, and he commanded his people to do the same. When God commands us to preach the gospel and refuse to do it or demean the vocation, we are being arrogant to the extreme. To deny the validity of evangelism, as some within the Christian church do, is treason. It is the mandate of Christ, and it is for the example of Christ to seek and to save the lost. For when even one is redeemed, the angels rejoice. A repentant sinner brings celebration and joy to heaven. Some questions linger. How diligently are you searching for the lost coins? Do you rejoice when somebody comes to Christ? Do you get excited at seeing souls being saved? Do you share God's feelings of love and pity and care for sinners? Is your heart so heavy for them that their repentance, their being found for the kingdom, swells your heart with joy? The way the woman searched for the lost coin and found it by lighting a candle begs to ask, is your candle burned out or are you using your light to lead others to salvation? Heavenly Father, we are, we're blessed. Blessed at the teachings of Jesus. As Jesus walked this earth, he taught us how to love one another. He walked with the sinners. He walked with the people that were looked down upon because of their status. He walked with them because no matter what, he loved them for who they were. And he taught them And we're even more blessed because he took their sins upon himself and felt the wrath of a just God. He loved us so much that he took all that pain and suffering upon himself so that we could have our sins forgiven. So that we, when we're lost, can be put upon Jesus' shoulders and taken home. He died on that cross so that when one accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior, all of the heavens rejoice. And for that, we are thankful. And Jesus didn't ask for much from us just that we go out and share the gospel with others. That we go out and look for the lost. The Holy Spirit dwells within us. Can show us the lost that need to be found. 
can guide our words so that the lost can hear them and can hear Jesus calling to them. Lord, we're just so thankful that you loved us so much that you sacrificed everything for us. That you conquered death and rose again. And Lord, we look forward to the day when you come back. But until that time, we know our work is not done. And we need to make sure that we are not ashamed to share that gospel with others. Lord, we just love you and we give you all the praise and glory for all you've done for us. In the name of Jesus, amen.